Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever and into ages of ages. Amen. Welcome back to all of our participants here for the 22nd Sunday in Ordinary Time. Welcome, Dr. Smith. Good to have you back with us. It's good to be with you. And if I can ask for a prayer for uh, all of our seminarians, by the time that many of you will be watching this, uh, Father and I will have done this in advance. And so the reason is that I'll be in the Holy Land uh, during the latter weeks of August. And so appreciate prayers for the seminarians, uh, deacons now, transitional deacons at Mundelein Seminary. We appreciate it very much. And we ask for your prayers as you make the journey to the holiest place on earth and uh, take the ICC family with you in your heart. Appreciate that. We're, we're looking now, as I said, at the 22nd Sunday in Ordinary Time. If you're taking notes, you can write down the biblical text here, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, and 6 and 8. Responsorial Psalm, Psalm 15, starting with verse 2 and following. Gospel is Mark chapter 7, which Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, 14 through 15, and 21 through 23. The epistle is, is the epistle of James, chapter 1, starting with verse 17. And this skips around a little bit too. So chapter 1, verse 17 through 18, 21 through 22, and verse 27. So here we go. We've got a theme here, doctor, really the question of the divided heart, of the external observance versus the um the uh internal reality of our of our moral struggle to follow christ and oftentimes i was just saying this to my parishioners a couple of uh, sundays ago is oftentimes this this dividing line goes just crosses right through our heart our adherence to the to the ways of god and yet oftentimes we live very much far from that we want to desire to and yet we fail and and uh, this is brought out here in the um, in each one of these readings. So let's begin in Deuteronomy chapter four, verse starting with verse one. Moses said to the people, "Now Israel, hear the statutes and decrees which I am teaching you to observe, that you may live and may enter in and take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving to you, in your observance of the commandments of the Lord your God." which I enjoin upon you, you shall not add to what I command you nor subtract from it. Observe them carefully, for thus will you give evidence of your wisdom and intelligence to the nations who will hear of all these statues and say, this great nation is truly a wise, intelligent people. For what great nation is there that has gods so close to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? Or what great nation has statutes and decrees that are as just as this whole as this whole law, which I am setting before you today. Doctor, as I usually do ask you to just contextualize what's going on in the book of Deuteronomy. What's the book of Deuteronomy all about? And then why is Moses saying what he's saying here? Why is the Lord speaking in such a way to the people? I think of all the books of the Pentateuch, Father, it's this one, maybe the book of Numbers too, that puzzles people. What is it all about? In this book, uh, we get a big clue from its name, right? The name is Deuteronomos, Duro meaning a second, and nomos is the uh, word used often in the Bible for law. So it's a second law. Uh, this is given really 40 years after the covenant and the Decalogue and the commandments are given at Sinai. And I want to go back just for a moment with you to kind of contextualize this back to Exodus 24. I, I think this really sets the stage for what we're going to be talking about looking at in these readings this Sunday. Uh, in Deuteronomy 24, uh, sorry, Exodus 24, I should say. Uh, there we have the ratification of the covenant at Sinai. I recall that Moses and the Israelites uh, have just come out of deliverance through the Red Sea at the Lord's hand. They've celebrated the first Passover, and they find themselves at the base of Sinai. Moses goes up, receives the law, and then he, he names it to the people. And then after the telling of the law in Exodus 20 through 23, in 24, we have this ratification scene. So let's look at it. Um, in verse 3, Exodus 24, 3, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the commandments. And the people answered, listen, watch this. And the people answered with one voice and said, all the words that the Lord has spoken, 
we will do. Now in kind of covenant theology terms, this is the ratification, this is the ownership. Uh, you know, God has done his part, now the people do their part and they profess it. And there's also a meal, so there's other elements of this as well. Dr. Scott Hans written a lot about this in his books. But I think what you see here is no matter the good intentions of the people, they're not able to do this. St. Paul will later talk about this in Romans 7, the good that I know I ought to do, I can't, I, I do not do, right? Mm -hmm. And so we, th this is the struggle, not just of the Israelites, Father, this is the struggle of the human race. This is the struggle of humanity, uh, that we, inside of us is this moral compass that points upward, points towards God, points towards the true, good, and beautiful. And here God has given them specific commandments to follow, saying, if you follow this path, you'll be on the path of life and goodness and peace and salvation. And I, I don't doubt that many in, that, in, the, in the tribes of Israel there uh, were being duplicitous. There probably were certainly evil doers. We know a few chapters later you have the great apostasy, but that was about 3,000. So many more probably said this with, with good intent. Yeah, we're going to do this. We're excited. We've got the law. And then what happens? Well, what happens is go back to Genesis, the fall, right? We need a savior. We're not able on our own to achieve moral perfection. We'll see this later uh, in the gospel reading from Mark, where you have the Pharisees who try to prevent sin by building all of these artificial constructs, all of this oral law, and it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. You know, doctor, um, this, this is uh, this kind of second law that's given a, a, a kind of a, a restoration that come to good here in Deuteronomy, I think is in some sense, a sad moment, uh, a warning to the people, a warning to all of us, but it's also an encouragement. That the Lord doesn't give up on his people. And so, and, and this is the whole purpose of reading the Old Testament to kind of see how the Lord acts, to learn how he acts in our lives and to learn the lesson of those generations that have gone before us so that we don't repeat their mistakes. But when we do, we have the constellation of God's faithfulness. Yeah, that's, that's true. And I think every time the covenant is renewed in the scripture, what you see is the Lord asks his people to look back, like look in the rearview mirror. And he's always saying, look at what I did. I'll give you an example of this right in our passage. In back to Deuteronomy 4, in verse 3, Moses tells the people, your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor. And this is a place where there was great apostasy and great idolatry to uh, this pagan Canaanite god Baal. So that he's reminding them that this was the evil uh, that was surrounding them. And watch what it says. For the Lord your God destroyed from among you all the men who followed uh, the Baal of Baor. But you who held fast to the Lord your God are alive today. And so there was a kind of a judgment that came down back 40 years earlier upon many of, really, frankly, their parents. He's talking about, because this is sort of that second generation. We often distinguish between the faithless and faithful generation. The faithless generation is the one that grumbled, mm -hmm. you know, Exodus into all that stuff. And they didn't make it into the promised land. And Moses himself, as the leader of those people, will, will in a Christ-like way, lay down his own life and does not go in either. Pays a great price for all of their sin. But nevertheless, this generation, as you said, has a second chance. And then um, notice also at the end of the passage, it says in verse six, keep them and do them, right? It's not enough just to keep them in our minds. It's, it's, and James gets into this too in his epistle, doing it. True religion is, to, is seen through what we do, through our works and activities and actions. And then you notice the evangelization that comes at the end of the passage. It's quite beautiful in verse six and seven. Uh, keep them and do them, uh, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who when they see all the statutes will say, surely this great nation is wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that a God so near to it as the Lord, our God is to us, that whoever we call upon him will be saved. So there's this sense of when we live the law, when we live rightly, other people will recognize that and hopefully it will turn many of those people to God. And so it's, it's, it's not just about us. Yeah. Our faithfulness when lived out in the church and in society has a great effect. We can never discount what effect that will have. Only God knows, but many will recognize true goodness, not hypocrisy, not religiosity, but true obedience, true love, true joy. And they'll see that and many will turn to the Lord. You know, here we, we see really the original purpose of the calling of Israel 
by the Lord to become a light to the nations. And, and of course, we hear that in the New Testament regarding the New Testament church, because it is the fulfillment of what the Old Testament church was meant to be. And that is not not uh, the, the ones who had received the law for the sake of themselves, but for the sake of the sanctification of the whole world and the restoration of communion with God, not just for themselves, but for their neighbors also. Uh, we, and, and, and we really internalize this in the responsorial psalm, which is, which is sung in the church this Sunday. The one who does justice will live in the presence of the Lord. And here, I think the church really focusing upon this, this question of doing justice. Yeah, it's one thing to say, yes, yes, Lord, and, and so forth, but, but, uh, but actually make our relationship with God a reality in our lives of how we live. And, the, and the, the psalm here goes through this. Whoever walks blamelessly and does justice, who thinks the truth in his heart and slanders not with his tongue. So not only thinking, but actually the, the doing, right? And who, who, who harms not his fellow man or takes up reproach against his neighbor by whom the reprobate is despised while he honors those who fear the Lord, who lends not his money at usury or accepts no bribes. So how important it is that we've received this gift of faith. It's the true way, is, as the original Christians were called, the way of life, the, the newness of the way of the Lord. But we actually make this uh, how we live our life. That's true. And I, I'd like to add here, this is going to sound kind of funny, but I want to add a certain defense of the skeptic and even the atheist. Bishop Barron talks about this. He says, you know, when the atheist points to heaven and says, oh, I don't believe that there's a big old, you know, bearded man in the sky. And Bishop Barron says, neither, neither do I. <laughs> there's something. And, and so my point here is in this psalm, you know, when you hear about this kind of hypocrisy, there is something right to be said about when the skeptic looks at religious people and says, oh, so much hypocrisy. Now, they may be jaded, but probably they have had some experiences that led them to that conclusion that maybe all religious people are hypocrites. That's not true, of course, but there's something that they're seeing about that that is actually naturally true and good and right, which is to say, you are saying these things, but do you actually live them out? And that really uh, brings a, a great amount of responsibility and a great amount of opportunity for us who really do love the Lord. We are going to stumble. We are going to sin. We are going to fall. But nevertheless, to try to root out that hypocrisy, because the world's watching and the world knows that, you know, Christian people are supposed to live differently. And this is what this passage in the Psalms and later we'll see in James calls us to, which is really living in a morally true and good way as best uh, to our ability and, uh, under God's grace. And in the gospel here, which comes from the gospel of Mark, chapter seven, chapter seven, verses one through eight, 14 through 15 and 21 through 23. Let's take a look at this now, applying what we've said so far. When the Pharisees, with some scribes who had come from Jerusalem, gathered around Jesus, they observed that some of his disciples ate their meals with unclean, that is, unwashed hands. For the Pharisees, and in fact all Jews, do not eat without carefully washing their hands, keeping the tradition of the elders. And on coming from the marketplace, they do not eat without purifying themselves. And there are many other things that they have traditionally observed, the purification of cups and jugs and kettles and beds. So the Pharisees and scribes question him, why do your disciples not follow the tradition of the elders, but instead eat a meal with unclean hands? He responded, well, did Isaiah prophesy about you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines human precepts. You disregard God's commandment but cling to human tradition. He summoned the crowd again and said to them, hear me, all of you, and understand, nothing that enters one from the outside can defile that person, but the thing that comes out from within are what defile. From within people, from their hearts, come evil thoughts, unchastity, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, licentiousness, envy, blasphemy, arrogance, folly, all these evils come from within and they defile. Doctor, I just ask you to help us understand from a biblical perspective, this isn't just about washing of hands, huh? the, the, the Old Testament understanding of, you know, I think a modern reader might think of their kids and the, you know, coming up with the muddy hands for lunch and the mom says, go wash your hands. But there's something more to this in the Old Testament, isn't there? 
Yeah, sir. We're talking about ceremonial ritual purity. This goes all the way back to the beginning of Israel's religion, it goes all the way back to the books we're just looking at, like Deuteronomy and the other books there, Leviticus. And so let's say the book of Leviticus. It, it's an often very confusing book for many people because you have these sacrifices and bloody sacrifices, and then you have all these rituals and rules, which just seem to the outsider to be like, oh, so much nonsense. Who cares what, what you eat as long as you love God? Uh, but what you see in the Old Testament is really God trying to take a people out from all the other nations and say, let's do this a little bit differently. Let's slow down your fast pace of living. Let's think about what goes into your body. Let's think about who you interact with. And like the temple is a good example of this, Father, because if you look at the temple structure, you've got all these different movements towards God. You have the Holy of Holies, which is only where the high priest goes, and him only but once a year. Then you've got the holy place with more priests, and then you've got the court of the uh, women, and then ultimately the court of the Gentiles. And what, what this sort of tells us is not that God favors some over others, but that he really demands and requires a, a true obedience. And so that high priest is meant to really image God. He's really meant to image God. And we should be thankful for the holy people in our lives that really do so. I mean, there's, there's a lot to be said about the kind of hypocrisy Jesus himself goes after it. But we can all think in our lives of people who really have tried to live and walk the walk, whether it's a priest, or a religious sister, a mom or a dad, a grandparent, to give thanks for those people. I wanted to say a word too, just about tradition here, because sometimes yeah. you'll hear um, among some non-Catholic Christians, will sometimes take this verse and sort of try to twist it and say, oh, gotcha, even Jesus was right. against human tradition. And then they put that together with sacred tradition. So let's just kind of clarify this. First of all, in this passage, uh, what Jesus is critiquing with this korban, which really means offering in verse 11 there at the end, is the kind of hypocrisy where people would not take care of their own parents and then take some of that money, bring it to the temple, and then donate it to God. And then there'd be you know benefits for them for that as well. And so what they were really doing is trying to do an end around, trying to keep more of their own money and then give it to the temple. Um, but in reality, they're neglecting their parents. So it was really something that Jesus went after and saw as hypocrisy and greed and, and all these and, and pride and so many other things kind of commingled there. Well, let's get back to the bigger issue of tradition. You sometimes hear this, uh, that you know, we don't need man-made traditions and isn't the Catholic religion so many man-made traditions? Well, no, uh, a really easy way to see this is uh, the Bible itself, which I'm holding up here, right? If you go back to the early community of Jesus and his followers, Jesus didn't write a book, right? It's his apostles who later wrote down the, their words for their followers. And so that early kerygma, as we call it, the kerygma or oral teaching, that is at the very root of it, the gospel, right? The gospel was first given, transmitted orally from person to person, from Jesus to the apostles to their followers. And it's only later, well after the apostles or died and gone to heaven in the second, really third and fourth century, that the Bible is collated and brought together the New Testament. And so we can say, without that process of the apostolic succession and bringing together and naming those inspired books of Holy Scripture, that is the process of tradition that gave us the Bible. So we could say, without tradition, we wouldn't even have our new, we would know what our New Testament is. There's a couple of great paragraphs in the Catechism, uh, paragraphs 80 and 81, 80 and 81, that really define very clearly what the living tradition of the church is. And 81, I believe, also distinguishes tradition with a small t, those things um, that can be changed, disciplinary things. And so there's a lot of misunderstanding out there about what tradition is and isn't. And every Catholic, every person would do well to read those paragraphs and really be up when people ask these questions about tradition. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Excellent. Let's take a look at James chapter 1, verse 17, 18, and then 21 through 22, and, and conclude with verse 27. James chapter 1, starting with verse 17. Dearest brothers and sisters, all good giving and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no alteration or shadow caused by change. He willed to give us birth by the word of truth, that we may be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Humbly welcome the word that, is, that has been planted in you and is able to save your souls. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deluding yourselves. 
Religion that is pure and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained by the world. I think, Doctor, we very much hit the center, the heart of what the church is trying to get across to us today, and that is be doers of the word and not hearers only. That's truly right. And it might be helpful here since uh, looking ahead, the next two Sundays after this one are also going to be the reading will be from the book of James, maybe just to say a few things about who this person yes, is, we know about him. So first, the letter itself. This is one of the epistles of the New Testament that's called the Catholic epistles. Well, they're all Catholic, but mm-hmm. this is Catholic with a small c, meaning kind of universal. Uh, the others include first and second Peter, and then first, second, and third John, and the book of Jude. So when you add James to that, you have seven so-called Catholic epistles. It's also just on a personal note, one of my favorites, because I think it's so unlike many of the other letters, even when Paul gets very practical, I, I would dare say that you, you can't find in such a small number of chapters, so many practical, wise teachings as in this beautiful little book of James. So who is he? Well, there is some uh, scholarly debate, and there always really has been about who this is, but let's go back to the book of Galatians just for a moment. Uh, the book of Galatians written by St. Paul, of course, and he's kind of laying out his gospel, his resume in chapter one there, Um, and uh, he begins, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, and so on, to the church of Galatia, and then he goes through his background, uh, going to Jerusalem, and so on, and then in verse 18 of chapter one, he says, then after three years, uh, this is at the very beginning, of course, after his conversion, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Peter, a Cephas, and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And so early tradition has it, along with St. Paul, that this, let's say, relative of Jesus, probably much like John. I was a little disappointed in the the show, The Chosen, which is pretty good overall, that where Jesus, uh, they identified each other as cousins, and this is very common, but I think of my cousins, and they're very, very close. We don't really know exactly how close Jesus and John were when we say cousins. They knew each other, of course, but we don't know exactly how close, whether they would have played together as kids and all that, and the same thing here. We're not really sure what brother means. Obviously, it's not, because Mary had no other children. It's not a child of Mary, Could it have been perhaps uh, a son of Joseph through a previous marriage? That's possible. There's a tradition about that, but we really don't know. We certainly would say it's a relative of the Lord, but certainly he's given a very, very beautiful letter. If you go to the beginning of it, Father, James chapter one, uh, we see who he addresses it to. Uh, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I really love that because even if he is, let's say, a, a brother a uh, stepbrother, so to speak, through Joseph or so. He doesn't say, hey, I'm, I'm you know, you got to listen to me because I'm, I'm his cousin or, no, he simply right. says, a servant of God and a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in dispersion. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Well, according to tradition, this James becomes the uh, leader of the Jerusalem church and is martyred right around the time that Peter and Paul are in the early 60s there. So certainly he knew affliction, persecution. He was a very public face of this new burgeoning religion, which was under fire and under persecution. And so this letter over the next three weeks or so, will be teaching us many great lessons here, not just for the Jewish Christians, but for the church today. I think it's a, it's a really marvelous letter, and I really pray over the next few weeks that people might take the time and read the whole letter. It's not that long. You can probably read it in one you know, Sunday after Mass. It really just runs five chapters, and every line is chock full of so many practical teachings like we see today. Yeah, it's really a moral encouragement to follow the ways of the Lord. As I, as I, as I uh, said uh, recently in one of our pre-class discussions at the ICC, it's, the question is not whether we we sin or not. And as the question is whether we say one thing with our mouth and do, do another thing with our, our lives, we do this all the time. The question is whether we're willing to struggle to, to live the life that God has given us. 
we are all fallen. We are all sinners. And yet the question is whether we're willing to continue to struggle with the grace of God to follow in his ways. Uh, we look forward to diving into this epistle of James. Encourage you this coming Sunday to say, Lord, though I may have said many things with my, with my lips and not followed them in my heart, not followed them in my life. Nevertheless, I'm dedicated to asking for the grace to open my heart, to be strengthened, to be able to actually walk in your ways. To Christ our God be glory, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Maria, et filia,